see all of you here this morning. It's a good day to be in God's house. And this is, and share it with the community, this is the best place to be on Sunday morning. Would you join me in the call of worship? Come, children of God, come and find refuge and strength. Our souls wait for the Lord more than those who watch the morning. Come, heirs with Christ, come and find forgiveness and joy. Our souls wait for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. Come, people of faith. Come to see who is attentive to our pleas. Our souls wait for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. Would you turn in your hymnals to number 77? I'll break our up.
join with me in our opening prayers as found in your book. Source of faithful love, you redeem us from our wrongs. We come before you today eager to be refreshed in body and to be made whole in spirit. Feed us from the living bread that comes down from heaven, for we are drawn to your Son as steel is drawn to a magnet. Build up our community of faith through the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may live as those who are worthy of our calling. In Christ we pray. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. A few announcements I've got here. Uh, one is the new upper rooms I have arrived, and they are back in the narthex in the entryway of the church. Um, if you would care to pick one up, uh, we've got both the regular and the large print. And if you know someone that would be profit from using those, please pick one up and take it to them. And if it's people that are here regularly, tell them how much we miss them. Um, let's see. Tomorrow evening, 7 o'clock, nominating committee will meet. Uh, would you believe it's time to start getting ready for charge conference? Uh, and, and like I told you last week, if, if your phone rings, answer. <laughs> Bible study starts on September the 8th. That's the Wednesday after Labor Day. We're going to be studying the book of Romans. And uh, uh, listen, this is basic. This is just basic stuff. So don't be concerned that it's going to be too deep or too strong or too, too heavy for you. Uh, this is just basic Bible study. We all kind of learn from one another, really. So come on out to Bible study. Um, let me see here. There are sign-up sheets in the front for coffee uh, uh, fellowship and for readers. Um, I think we have got volunteers through the end of the year, I believe, for coffee fellowship, which I am very grateful. Do you know... Now, this isn't in the book. This isn't in the book. But I'm really convinced that the people that make the coffee for the church, there's a special place in heaven. I'm just convinced of that in my own head and my own heart. So, so be mindful of that. But come on. And then this morning after worship service, after worship service, yes. Uh, and I will try not to go over this morning. <laughs> uh, we're downstairs in the fellowship hall. Yes, we're all set up and ready. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, but there are sign-up sheets up here, if, especially for readers uh, if you care to be a lector, that's the fancy word for it, uh, to read the epistle lesson or the Old Testament lesson, whatever it might be. Something I might share with you, too, is if you notice in your bulletin, I put from week to week what the, what the readings are going to be in the lectionary, the Revised Common Lectionary. For every Sunday, there is an Old Testament reading, a psalm. An epistle lesson, usually it's an epistle lesson, uh, and a gospel lesson. So if you read those, uh, and if I haven't called here, nobody's got in touch with you as to what that that reading is going to be. You'll find it there among those among those four, four readings. Um, council meeting on Tuesday, eight seventeen, August seventeen. Do note the difference from Wednesday to Tuesday. We're going to start meeting on Tuesdays at six o'clock. So keep that in mind. And prayer requests. Uh, as you come in the door, there are cards there. If you've got prayer requests, we aren't announcing those uh, worldwide because we're out in the, in the, in the whole world now with, uh, with our computers and uh, with our ability to, to send our worship service out. Um, but come in, pick up a card if you have a prayer request. Drop it in the jar that's on the table in the narthex or give it to the usher when they take up the collection. And if we have them, we'll put them in the basket and pray over all of our prayer requests at one time. So please keep that in mind. I believe that's all the announcements I have. If the ushers will come forward, we'll receive the morning offer.
praise and thanksgiving for your many blessings. We pray to you to receive our tithes and offerings, that they may be for the world signs of the bread of heaven and the fullness of your grace. For we come here hungry for your spirit, and you feed us with food that satisfies. We came here thirsting for your grace, and you receive us, you revive us in our need. In humble gratitude, we thank you. Amen. Would you turn in your hymnals to number 526? Bet you know this one. What a friend we have in Jesus.
For the Spirit of the Lord is there as the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father, Father infinite in wisdom, wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love to set forth the example of our blessed Lord to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. in your few Bibles. Chapter 4, verse 25. Living as children of light. Therefore each of you must put all falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Down to chapter 5. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering, fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Thank you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to our Lord Jesus Christ. Our gospel text this morning is a continuation of our study of the sixth chapter of John. Let me read to you from verse 35 and verses 41 through 51. John 6, 35 and 41 through 51. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The Jewish opposition grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They asked, isn't this Jesus, Joseph's son, whose mother and father we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus responded, don't grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless they are drawn to me by the Father who sent me, and I will raise them up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has listened to the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. I assure you, Whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that whoever eats from it will never die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Please pray with me. Gracious God, may the words that I speak in this moment and the thoughts we think and the feelings that we experience just now, may they all be acceptable in your sight. And may they all be profitable for our instruction and for our inspiration. In Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. This text begins with a verse from last week, if you recall. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And if you've been noticing, this is the third sermon, the third text, if you will, uh, that following the feeding of the 5,000, that's been about bread. The third the third sermon, as a matter of fact, there's going to be five of these sermons that come from John, the sixth chapter. Uh, five sermons dealing with the subject of the bread of life. Truly, there's nothing much more basic than bread. You know, you want lunch, and there's not much in the house, not much in the refrigerator, uh, nothing terribly exotic, nothing special. Just take maybe a slice of meat, Maybe a slice of cheese, put it between 
two slices of bread. Or it might get more basic than that. Just a little bit of peanut butter and a little bit of jelly and or a little bit of jelly between two slices of bread. Even the most inhumane punishment that we've ever heard about, what is it? Bread and water. So, um, nothing, nothing in this life really much more basic than bread. But what is this bread of life that Jesus talked about? I would submit that there are times when it's beneficial to go back and to look at the basics of our faith. Just to remind ourselves what we believe. We've talked about that with our affirmations of faith, with our Apostles' Creed, with our modern affirmations. Sometimes it's good just to go back and take a look. Uh, refresher, if you will. Uh, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. It's really hard to get our minds around, isn't it, when you think about it. It's, it's easy to remember when something begins and when something ends. And we've got to put that sort of a thing, notion about our universe. Uh, many thoughts about what happened. Then you've heard about the Big Bang. You've heard about uh, the, the, all of the elements in the universe coming together and forming little balls or whatever, whatever. Uh, it's just hard to get our minds around something that never had a beginning. God created the earth, the heavens, the universe, and everything that's in it. How? Well, that's debatable. You've heard some scientists say this, you've heard some scientists say that, and you've even heard some preachers say this, that, or the other thing. I would submit to you that it's unimportant how. The important thing is that we know and understand that God created it, that God has been there forever. God was there before time. God has always been. And then God created humans in his own image, spirit, and flesh. Uh, again, don't know exactly how. Sometimes scientists say this, some scientists say that. We have the creationists in it. And again, I don't really care how. God created us. God created us even, even if it's evolution, even if the animals sort of evolved from a single cell organism to whatever they might be now, there was some point in time when God said, I'm going to put my spirit into these creatures. There were those creatures. There were those first ones that God put his spirit into. And when God put his spirit into it, he gave those people, created them just like him, created them in his image so we could have fellowship with him. We are puppets. God has a choice in what to do and how to do. And you see there are even times in the Bible when he changes his mind because somebody has prayed to him, somebody has asked him. People of Israel wanted a king. He didn't want to give him a king. They cried and they moaned and they carried on to the fact that they didn't give him a king, much to their own chagrin, much to their own disappointment and what happened from Solomon on, but nevertheless. Gave us a choice. We are not puppets. And God didn't create evil. We had the freedom. Humanity had the freedom to do what they would, and unfortunately, they chose to turn their backs on God. They chose not to do it God's way. They chose to do it their own way. Just like in the story of Adam and Eve, they chose to eat the fruit they weren't supposed to eat. And sin grew, and sin grew sin grew. And the Old Testament shares with us the story of Noah and the flood and how God wiped it all out and started over again. But you know, it wasn't long. If you read that story in the Old Testament, if you go back to Genesis and read through that, you find out that it wasn't long after the flood was over that they started sinning again. Kind of nastily, too. I'll let you look that up. You can read that for yourself. God chose Abraham because he saw that Abraham was a good man. Abraham was faithful. Abraham understood some of whom God was. And God chose Abraham then to father a nation, to father a people 
to father people who believed in him as God, as the only God, not looking at all the different kinds of Baals and the, all the different kinds of gods of this and gods of that, idols built and so forth, but that Abraham knew and understood there was one God. And God revealed himself to Abraham. And Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac fathered Jacob, and Jacob fathered 12 tribes. He had 12 sons, and each one of those tribes were God-fearing people. They knew and they understood. But once again, there was sin. There was evil. And Joseph's brothers sold him into Egypt as a slave, as a slave to those people. But Joseph found favor in the eyes of Pharaoh. Remember that? And, 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 and the, the, the Hebrew people in that day and that time, they grew and they prospered and they, until Pharaoh got to thinking that maybe they were too strong. Uh, that they could take over, and he enslaved them. The Israelites were an enslaved people in the land of Egypt. And the people cried out. And they were there for quite a while. We don't really understand the how and the why of all of that, but they heard, God heard their cry and sent Moses sent Moses to go and to let them out. Moses was well qualified. He grew up in Egypt. From a babe in a basket in the river Nile, he grew up from there until he fled from there one day. But he grew up. God brought him back to lead the people out, and when they did that, they established laws. Laws to set up and, and, and start a whole new culture, a whole new nation. God gave them law so that they could know what pleased God and what didn't please God. And among those laws, God demanded that they give a blood sacrifice for their sins. And that was how he, how he shared with them that when they did things wrong, that was what they needed to do was to give a blood sacrifice. Just so they would know and understand who God was and that God was almighty and that God was over them. The people broke laws. And God established judges. Now it's interesting there wasn't a ruling person, there, there wasn't law, there wasn't government like we know and understand because God had said to the people the only government that would be over them would be him. But he established judges so that when there were, when there were disagreements, when there were dis that problems between people, they could take him to the judge and the judge would settle. The judge would know what the law was and he would settle their differences. And but they wanted a king. They, wanted, they saw the nations around them had a king. They didn't have a king. They thought they would be better off if they had a king. God didn't want to give them a king. They insisted. So God, through his prophets and through his judges, had a king appointed. And that was King Saul. And that was a mess. So God called on David to be the king. And he made a covenant with David that as long as his descendants, as long as his sons, if you will, on down the line, would stay with the covenant that God had made with Moses, that his, his descendants would be on the throne of Israel. But the kings were evil. If you read through the Old Testament, you will see where all of the kings were evil, almost all of them. There were a couple of, couple of good ones in there, a couple of God-fearing ones in there, but most of those kings were evil. And what happened? Isaiah the prophet told them that if they continued to live the way they were living, they were going to be exiled. They were going to be taken out of the land that God had given them and exiled away to some foreign place. And they didn't listen. They didn't listen. So what happened? The Babylonians came in, took over, and exiled them all to Babylon. Not all of them, not the few there. Left a few, those that could work the land, those that could do things for the Babylonians, left them there, but took everybody that was an artist, everybody that was a craftsman, everybody that, that was uh, a business person, all of the main people out of Israel were exiled to Babylon. Well, it worked through the Medes, beat the Babylonians, and the Persians beat the Medes. And Darius, king of Persia, told the people that they could go home and reestablish their nation, reestablish their culture. But as time went on, the oral traditions of the rabbis became more important than the laws that God had given to Moses. They came together and they tried to find every single kind of 
application for every single law. And they made those more important than they did. What they did was trying to set themselves above everybody else. Trying to set themselves and, 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 and their class, if you will, above everybody else. And it was corruption once again. That didn't work too well. So Father God sent Jesus. Sent Jesus to be the ultimate sacrifice, if you will, that blood sacrifice that would work once for good and for all of the people. Why? Why did he do that? The Bible tells us. He did it because he loves us. He loves us. For God so loved the world, most important in, in my thinking, most important part of that verse, that verse that we all learn. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. It takes a lot of love. That takes a lot of love. That he gave his only son. Why? So that whoever believes on him wouldn't perish. But would have everlasting life. God loves us that much and Jesus Christ loves us that much with the same unconditional love that the Father had and he was willing to go to the cross. He was willing to suffer all of that pain and suffering, all of that heartache, all that abandonment from all of the people that loved him and cared about him. All of his disciples fled and ran away while he was here. Jesus taught us how to live. Taught us how to serve taught us how to minister to one another. Jesus fed people. He taught people. He met people's needs. Certainly we know over and over and over again he healed people. And Jesus reinforced the Old Testament law to love your Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And the night before he died, he gave us a new commandment. That we're to love one another as he loved us. And Jesus died. And Jesus rose back up again. There was Friday. But by golly, there was Sunday. Jesus rose again. To prove he was divine. To prove he was God's son. And to prove that he could be trusted so that all of the things that he said and that he taught and that he commanded could be believed in. Because he loved us. So we must love each other. I've been doing some thinking lately. We hear people talking about what they're not going to do because of their rights and that their rights have been violated and their rights have been we are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights. Look at the four Gospels and you will not find anything in there about rights. Except the right of God to be as merciful and as gracious as God wants to be. You won't find it. But we are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights. How is that done? I'm going to suggest to you that that's done Sort of by the back door. Yeah, we've got rights. I've got right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness because all of you have been commanded to love me with the same love you love yourself with. I've been commanded to love you with all of the love that I love myself with. If we do that, if we have mutual love for one another, then by virtue of that, we've got the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus. And have eternal life. He says in this work, in this written work, that the bread that he gave us is his flesh. The bread which we partake is spiritual by believing. So often in the book of John, I've told you about there are these two level conversations where Jesus is talking about something spiritual and the human being that he's talked to is getting all hung up in the physical thing. We talked about Nicodemus being born again and he wondered how that could happen. Talked about the woman in the well. 
and the water in the bucket that Jesus didn't have to bring the water. He wasn't talking about that. He's talking about something spiritual. This bread that he is talking about, this bread of life, is something that's spiritual. And if we partake of that, if we believe in that, and believe in Jesus Christ and what he did for us, and did because of his love for us, then we are partaking of this bread of life. Be satisfied. Believe in Christ. Never be hungry. Never be thirsty. Because that's consuming the bread of life. Amen. If you turn in your hymnals to number 156, I love to tell the story.
receive the charge and the blessing. Let us pray for just a moment. I've neglected to thank God for the blessings that are going to our friends in need, to bless our food, and to bless the, the collection, the small change collection uh, that we've got. Would you, would you bow with me, please? Holy, gracious God, we are grateful for your people who have given of their abundancy, Father, to help those who are in need. The food that has been gathered here, we pray that you would bless it, that people who receive it will be nourished, both in body and in spirit, knowing that there are people that love them and care about them. Bless the monies that have been collected, Lord, to go to the Heifer Project, uh, that people here or around the world might know and understand that there are people who care. <coughs> now go forth from this place and imitate the Holy One in all you do. Bring <coughs> with love, speak with, love, with, love, with, with kindness, touch, touch with gentleness, walk with, with humility, humility, and build, and build up, up the kingdom of God. God. Go forth into the world and live in love as Christ has lived in through you. Amen. <coughs> Thank you.